Praise the Lord, everyone. It's good to see you all tonight. And uh, thank you for coming out on Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. And uh, I want to um, say up front that um, normally we do not have Wednesday night Bible class before Thanksgiving. As long as I can remember, we either moved it to Tuesday night or we didn't have it at all. But this year, I could not get peace about not having Bible class tonight, and so here we are. So if you have a, a bone to pick with me, with somebody, the buck stops here, because I made that decision with me and the Lord together. He said, and I just said, okay. So here we are on Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, but thank you for being here. Those of you who are joining with us online, uh, we are grateful to you, and Marlena and Brianna, you're going to think I'm staring at you, but you're right in line with the camera. So and Tonight we are continuing the series, The Ministry of the Saints, and God has given me two more pieces to this series, and tonight we're going to look at one of those. But before we do, I want us to go to the Lord in prayer. I know there are, um, there are a few needs to make. Uh, you and I are aware of, we need to pray, continue to pray for J.R. Shiplett. Um, Brother Baldwin and I went to see him yesterday, as far as you can tell, you know, he's just weak in body, but um, his mind is good, and we had a great conversation yesterday, we talked about deer hunting, and fishing, and frog gigging, and eating squirrel. We really had a good visit yesterday. So continue praying for, for J.R. and his family during this time. And then continue lifting up Brother Juan and Sister Julie. She is feeling a lot better, but we still need to lift them up. Brother Baldwin is walking uh, without crutches. He is using a cane. So God has done a marvelous work since breaking the largest bone in his body. Um, it's been right at six weeks, and uh, it is amazing to see what God is doing in him. And uh, continue praying for Ed, Sister Annie's husband. Um, it is amazing with what he has been through and what he is not experiencing. And God has been very kind to him through all of this and he's having still no pain. And so we are grateful to the Lord for that. Amen. Amen. So I know that you probably have requests tonight, and there are others, I'm sure. But if you would join with me, would you stand right there if you're at home and you want to join with us? And let's go to the Lord together in prayer. I am, I am anticipating that when we come together, that what happens Sunday morning is going to become the norm. Where we come in and we anticipate the outpouring or the manifestation of the presence of God. Even on Bible class with just a few of us here and people joining online, we can still experience the power and presence of God. Amen. People can still be healed even if no one in the room is sick. Someone tonight out there can, can find exactly what they need through God's Word and His Spirit because God is not limited to a building. Right. He's not limited to any time or space. God is omnipotent. He's omnipresent. He is able to do exceeding abundantly yes. above all that we can ask or think because he is seated far above all principality and power and might. I love those superlatives that, that the apostle uses to describe Jesus and where he is and where he is sitting and the power that he has far above all principality. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, what an honor, what a great privilege to join together in prayer. God, we come together in one mind and one accord. God, we, we, are, we are coming to one mind and one accord. We've come from all different places today, work and school and, and home. And wherever we have been today, Father, we are gathering together now for these few moments in this room to study your word. But, O oh Lord, we unite our hearts and minds in this prayer for the will of the Father to be done tonight in this place and those watching online. 
God, the sick and the infirm, the weak, the troubled, the, the weary, the downcast, Lord, Lord those who are, are in earth, struggling with doubt and fear and unbelief. Father, right now, upon the authority of God's word and by the power of the Holy Ghost, in the name of the Lord Jesus, we bind up the spirit of fear. We bind up doubt. We bind up unbelief. And God, we cast those things down to the pit from which they have come. And we lose the gift of faith in this room and those watching online tonight. We lose faith, O oh Lord. Faith to hear the word of the Lord. And faith not just to be a hearer, but a doer of the word. Faith, O oh Lord, to believe that when we speak to the mountain, you said that it would be moved, it would be plucked up and cast into the sea. That if we would not doubt, O oh Lord, it would happen. And so tonight, in the name of Jesus, by your word, now we speak the word of faith. Ed Perez, Leon Ball, and Brother Juan, Sister Julie, J.R. Shipman, and family, be strengthened, be renewed, be healed, be refreshed, be made whole. Lord, not our will for each one of those, but your will be done for those tonight, O oh Lord. We're grateful for what you have done. We're grateful for what you have not even allowed in their lives. But Lord, by faith in Jesus' name, we believe that you are still able to heal every single one of these people. But you have a plan and a purpose. And so tonight, oh Lord, we say to you, nevertheless, Father, not our will, but thine be done. And God, those traveling tonight, those going out of town for the holidays, God, we pray for your safekeeping on their vehicles, the tires, the road before them, Lord, traveling there and then home. Sister Susie tonight, oh Lord, you know what's going on with her body, the strength and the healing that she needs, oh Lord. In the name of Jesus and God, and, not, and last but certainly not least, that in this room, that as we study your word, oh Lord, you would speak to us. It's your word. And by your spirit, Lord, speak to us, we pray. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you, Lord. So tonight, as we continue the series on the ministry of the saints, I want you to go with me to the book of Ephesians, and we're going to chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And um, as you're turning there, as you're getting your electronic device out and you're scrolling, picking the right app and scrolling to your, well, there is a couple of Bibles. Congratulations. Amen. Let me just recap where we've been over the last three weeks. We started out reading our text from Acts chapter 2, verse 38 through verse 47 to the, basically the end of the chapter of Acts chapter 2. And I, I, I've said it every time that we've read that text, not to try to read between the lines of why we're reading Acts 2.38, but it's very important as we study the ministry of the saints where this comes from, where did the ministry of the saints actually originate? And so as we are studying this, we're finding very quickly that what happened on the day of Pentecost was the, was the beginning of the church. And all of the people that were born into the church on that day were, were born again saints. These are the people of God. This is what Paul in Ephesians chapter 1 calls the body of Christ, the saints. He even writes it that chapter 1 of Ephesians is a letter written to the saints. Then we read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 through 3. Paul writing to the saints and the faithful in Christ Jesus. And there, he's writing these letters. These are letters written to the body of Christ, the church as a whole. So these are the people of God, and we would call them, as the scriptures do, saints. Then we read Ephesians chapter 4, where the Bible says that when Jesus ascended, after descending first into the lower parts of the earth, and he died on the cross, was buried, rose again, he ascended into heaven, led captivity captive, which was death, hell, and the grave, and then he gave gifts unto men. 
And we found out that those gifts are the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And their purpose was for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, um, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and to the knowledge. I'm going to butcher the rest of it. Of the Son of God unto a perfect man. Right. Exactly. Until, until we finally make it into a perfect man, the body of Christ becoming perfect. All of its joints and bands which are connected, all of the joints of the body and the muscles and the tissue that connect all of the joints together in the body, these are, um, that's what makes our body work. You know, like I showed you the last time, you know, the shoulder is probably one of the most versatile joints we have because, you know, no other joint in your body can do what, what the shoulder can do. You know, you can pat yourself on the back. You can scratch your own back pretty well. You, you can't do a great job with that, but um, you need a spouse for that. Amen. Um, I heard one amen. Um, and it's pretty amazing what the body can do. And because it's put together the way that it is. And so this is the body of Christ. It is put together the way it is for its purpose. And as we sit here tonight, as many of us as are here, each one of us are different in where we, in what part of the body we represent in the kingdom of God. And so each member of the body of Christ is a saint. And those saints all have their own purpose, their own purpose. Well, the saints as a whole have their purpose, but each one of us have a different part of the body that we fulfill. So we've been, as we've studied this, the point that I need to hurry to right now is that we need to understand what the saints ministry is. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What did they do? They went house to house, they broke bread, they had fellowship, and then the Bible says that they were even daily in the temple. And the Bible says, as they were doing these things, breaking bread from house to house, they did eat their bread with singleness of heart. They had fellowship one with another, and they even met in the building. They went to the temple daily, and also house to house. And the Bible says, and, and the Lord added to the church. Anybody remember? The Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. So the ministry of the saints, and it, it, it says they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. It doesn't take the apostles out of the picture, but the saints continued in the apostles' doctrine. So as the saints were fulfilling their ministry, the Lord was adding to the church on a daily basis. And you remember one of the things that I said in the beginning was the ministry of the saints is everything that Jesus did when he walked the earth. And God gave me that, that the first time I said it, I hadn't written it down yet, so I included it tonight so I wouldn't forget it because now I have proof that what God said to me is, is the truth. The ministry of the saints is everything that Jesus did when he walked the earth. And this is the text that we're about to read. So in Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to start reading at verse number 1. It begins with and, it, and, and, A-N-D, which is a conjunction, which is like it's tying together everything from chapter 1, which is we ended chapter 1 with the part where... Um, where God set the Lord Jesus Christ far above all principality and power and place, verse 21 of chapter 1, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Does. Something will not leave me alone right here, so I had to get rid of it. So he says that we are the body of Christ, that all of the members of the body, we make up the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 23 says, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth 
all in all. Now, chapter 2, verse 1 of Ephesians. And you have he quickened. And you have. Okay, now I want you to pay attention to how many past tense references Paul uses in chapter 2. And you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Wherein in time past you walked. In time past. Ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation. Now that word conversation in the King James is not conversation as, a, as talking between people. This conversation is in reference to manner of life, your way of living, the way you conduct yourself. He said, among whom the, the children of disobedience, we all had our conversation in time fast in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace you are saved. And have raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace. In his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. Not of works lest any man should boast. Now here's the scripture. Here's the proof. That the ministry of the saints is everything that Jesus did when he walked the earth. For we are his workmanship. God's workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. Which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. Now, the wording of the scripture, when I read that, it's been a couple of weeks ago that when I came across this, and it, it struck me immediately that this is what this represents. This is, this is the ministry of Christ Jesus in the earth. This is everything that he said, everything he did, and I'm, I'm going to show you in just a minute how, how important this is and, and how amazing this is when we stop to consider that every person who is born again of the water and the spirit is called by God as a saint. Number one, before we are called as an apostle, a prophet, evangelist, a pastor, and a teacher, before we're called anything else, we are first and foremost called to be a saint. Because you can't be anything else until you first become a saint. And that is someone who has heard the gospel, and then has obeyed the scriptures and been born again of the water and of the spirit. So the apostle Paul says in verse 10 again, for we are God's workmanship. Let me just paraphrase that right there because you, verse 8 says, it is the gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. So that's the last reference to anyone there, God or the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that he, that we should walk in them. Now, when you consider this and you, and you start letting your mind and letting your heart, letting your spirit Connect with the verses that, that the Bible is showing us about the body of Christ and the ministry of the saints. Just for a second, let your mind wander to the Judean hillside when Jesus is walking through Galilee and or Capernaum and when he's um, walking along and he's, he curses a fig tree and he tells his disciples that if you have the grain of mustard seed and then he's approached by a leper and he touches the leper and he makes him whole and then he's uh, breaking bread and fish and handing it to his disciples and they're passing it to 5,000 men. Just, just let the ministry of Jesus sink in for a second. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? It's, it's very miraculous to, re to think about the ministry of Christ. But here in verse 10, the Apostle Paul is telling us that God has created us 
in the Lord Jesus Christ for unto good works which God had before ordained, before ordained, before you and I ever existed. Chapter 1 of Ephesians says that we were predestinated to this ministry from the foundation of the world, before God ever formed the heavens and the earth, before the first animal was ever created, before there was a firmament between the waters, when he separated the waters, before all of that took place. But there was a cross on, the, on a hill in, in Jerusalem, and there were people who had been foreordained to this ministry, you and me. And it was already in the mind of God. And this is what he says, which God had before. Before when? Well, before, I don't know, how far back do you want to go? How far back does God go? Regardless of how far back he goes, it was foreordained that we should walk in those good works which the Lord Jesus Christ did. So I asked the question, what did Jesus do? So let's just break it down. Mark 1, 35. We'll start here. Mark chapter 1, verse 35 says, And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and there prayed. Okay. So we know that, that Jesus was, was pretty um, faithful to go to, to pray every single day. You know, the, the scriptures, we don't see it every day, but there's no way that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, in flesh, living among men, did not dedicate his life to prayer. He didn't have a prayer life. He had a life of prayer. He lived that every single day. He got up every single morning to find, know, and do the will of the Father. This is what Jesus did. And this is what prayer is for. Prayer is not just for me to bring my prayer request list and lay it before the Lord and just go through my list day after day. That's not the purpose of prayer. Do I bring petitions and requests? Of course we do. But that's not our, that's not our agenda. At least it shouldn't be my agenda when I approach the throne of grace every day. If I just come in and all I've got is needs, Then, and if that's the only way I'm going to pray, then and I heard Bishop Wright say this one time, if my prayers are need-based, guess what? The Lord's going to make sure that I'm going to have plenty of needs so that I'll at least pray. Yeah. But if my prayers are based upon a prayer that we're going to look at in just a second, that is, that is prayed according to the will of the Father, then now we are connecting in his will and for his will and for the purpose of his kingdom. And guess what? God loves to answer those kinds of prayer. Mm -hmm. So we know first and foremost that Jesus prayed. That's what Jesus began his whole life and ministry with. And, and, you, and you don't know anything about him from birth to age 12. Birth, we know about his birth. It was the miraculous birth of the Lord Jesus. Then at 12 years old, we learn a little bit about him. Then we don't find anything else about him in the scriptures until he reaches the age of 30. When he walks out of the carpenter's shop for the last time and tells his mom and his brothers and sisters goodbye and he heads out on the road to begin his earthly ministry and his first miracle in Cana of Galilee where he turned water into wine. And even then, he said, it's not my time. And his mom says, yes, it is your time. And he she tells the servants, whatever he tells you to do, do it. I think you, you touched on that Sunday morning, didn't you, Brother Barber? See, I was listening. And so we don't know much about him, but we, we have to believe that because he was a Jewish child, therefore, he, he knew the Torah. He knew the law of Moses. He knew the Pentateuch, Genesis through Deuteronomy. He knew those books because that's what they taught in Torah or in, in Jewish school because the boys went to Jewish school. So we, we know he was taught to pray. So we know that he was taught to follow after the things of God. Well, I mean, obviously he was the son of God. So therefore, we know that he lived this kind of life. So when we first learn about his ministry, we know that he began with prayer. 
So the next thing I ask you is, what did Jesus pray? Well, the answer is, he had to have prayed what he taught us to pray. Matthew chapter 6. You can turn there with me. Give me just a second. My uh, notes froze. Matthew 6, beginning in verse number 5. And I, I didn't copy these in red, but these words are in red in Matthew chapter 6. If you have a red letter edition, these are the words of the Lord Jesus. And he says, And when you pray, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward, but thou, or when you, but when you pray, enter into your closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. So we know that it's important to find that place of prayer. Yes, we, we do pray corporately. Yes, as we did Sunday morning, we pray together in this room, and we we join, we lift our voices, and, and then there are times when we pray quietly, and but, but we're not doing it for show, but it's a, it's a time for corporate prayer. But Jesus was condemning those who would go stand on the corner and find a very conspicuous spot in the crowd and stand on the corner and make loud prayers, repeating words over and over and over just to be seen and heard of men. And Jesus said, they have their reward. And their reward is to be seen of men and to, whoo, Man, that was an awesome prayer I saw you praying today. Man, you look sharp doing it too. That was their reward. I, um, I don't know, Sister Andy, you, you may remember this. Um, my wife may remember this as well. But um, a Brother Kelsey Griffin came here uh, many, many years ago. You, you remember Brother Kelsey Griffin? And uh, he was ministering. It was. It might have been uh, some day sessions and some night services that we were having. But... I don't even remember the subject, but he said something. This he, he was telling the story, I believe it was from first hand knowledge. And he said that the pastor's wife in, in this particular church he, he was at stood up and told the church, just boldly proclaimed, uh, I'm going on a seven day fast. Who's going with me? And Brother Kelsey Griffin said, and you know what? She cashed her check right then. You remember that, Sister Annie? He said, she cashed her check. What does that mean? She didn't lay up a treasure in heaven. She cashed her check here. She got all of the reward that she was going to get out of that seven-day fast by telling everybody, hey, woohoo, look at me. I'm going on a seven-day fast. Well, bless your sweet little heart. There are times when we do corporate fasts. That's different. But when God convicts you, or not, maybe not convicts you is the right word, but when God deals with your heart about some type of consecration that he would like from you, it's not something we readily talk about. It shouldn't be something that we broadcast to the world that this is what we are doing to get closer to the Lord because that's, that's something private. That's him dealing with our hearts and drawing us to him, right? This is what Jesus was condemning. He said, when you pray, go into your room, shut the door, go into your closet, if you please. And when you have shut the door, pray to thy father, which is in secret, and thy father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. And we know that to be the truth. Because when you pray and you walk with God alone in your prayer closet, You, you can concur with this if it's true for you. You can say amen if it's true for you. But I know it to be true for myself that when I go into my closet and I, and I do invest 
time in prayer with my father. Nobody knows how long, at least as far as I'm concerned, I don't tell anybody how long I pray. It's really none of anybody's business. It's, it's that we invest time, not spending time. Because when you spend time, you don't get that back. It's like spending money to go to the grocery store. You, 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 you spend money on groceries. Well, the only thing you're getting out of that is groceries. And that's fine and wonderful and that's delicious and we love groceries. But what happens to the groceries? It, you know, that's all you get out of it. But when you invest time in something, you are investing in something that you're going to get a return on, correct? Right. So when I invest time in prayer, then when I go out into the public place or stand in front of a place like tonight, ministering the word of the Lord here, that's when the Holy Ghost, that's when God begins to um, let everyone know that you have been in prayer with him. He does that. I don't have to do that for myself. I invest the time behind closed doors and then he rewards openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Now I love this whole chapter, Matthew 6. We're not going to cover it in great in, 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 all the way through, but just for a moment, we're going to look at the, these first 10 verses, 5 through 15. But you look at the number of times that Matthew records Jesus' words about the Father knowing what we have need of before we ask. So I don't have to bring my list to him. He knows what I need. Right. So what am I supposed to pray? This is what Jesus taught us to pray. He says, and when you pray, Luke says it like this, and when you pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So what is the point? The whole point that Jesus is teaching us here is that every single day Jesus prayed and he went to his father to find, know, and do the will of his father every single day. And Jesus exemplified this principle throughout his earthly ministry. If he's going to tell us after this matter, therefore pray ye, then we need to take notice that the Lord Jesus is God manifest in the flesh, and it is impossible for God to lie. He can't go back on his word. So if Jesus is telling us to pray this, and he's saying that this is what I did, then we should take it to heart and believe that he did this. And he is teaching the saints of the Most High God how to fulfill his ministry in the earth. You think about this. Jesus is not here. You've heard me say this a lot of times. And maybe I say it for my sake and not so much for yours. Maybe the more I say it, finally it will get ingrained into my spirit and I will actually start to believe this. Yeah, I, I said that. I did. I, I said that because there are times that, and you, you, you can vouch for this, Brother Barber, there are times when we have to preach stuff that we haven't fully grasped. We haven't fully wrapped our minds and hearts around it to the point that I have understanding. Sometimes we just have to preach what God gives us, whether I get it or not. And then while I am speaking many times, and you probably can concur, many times while I am ministering the word of the Lord, I, I'm getting it while I'm saying it to you. So the point to this prayer is Jesus is teaching us, go find your Father's will every single day. Know it. Get it in your spirit and then get up and go do the will of God every single day. 
And, and, and we were having a conversation, my wife and I was having this conversation with someone the other day, and we were talking about this. And we, it's been ingrained in me. I, I will say me. I won't say we. But for me, this is what I grew up in. That every single day of our life, when we were taught that we need to work for God. We need to get up and, and, and you need to be busy. You need to be doing something for God all the time. Don't let the grass run under your feet. Be busy. Work, work, work for God. Work for God. Well, guess what I'm finding? I, from my own experience, Brother Garcia, I'm finding that there are days he doesn't have me, quote unquote, doing anything except praying and investing time with him and his word. And I don't know if, that's, if you've experienced that or not, but I'm going to tell you, it goes against the grain of what's been it's been taught me all of my life. And I have to work through this in Latin, and I really seek the Lord and say, okay, um, is this really what you're telling me? I don't, I don't have to do, I don't have to quote unquote do anything. No, I want you to stay right here and be with me and let me talk to you. But, but I, I need to be busy. No, this is my will for you today. And Sister Annie, if I do the will of God every single day, then I'm actually taking a brick out of the pile, as it were, and I'm, in, and I'm putting it into this overarching plan and building that God has for my life. I'm doing that. I'm putting into his plan for my life. Every time I do his will, he's, well, I maybe mean, I'm not putting the bricks in, but he's investing in my building. Putting my life together so that when I stand before his throne on that day, he's going to look at the blueprint for my life and he's going to look at my life and he's going to say, well done, enter in. But I didn't, uh, but Lord, I didn't work every day. I, I didn't go to the office every day. I, I didn't, um, I, I didn't do something every day. Well, according to the blueprint and what I see here, you did my will. And isn't that the most important thing? Did Jesus do the same thing every day? I find in the scriptures there were times when Jesus and his disciples pulled away from the crowd, got in a boat, and to go to another location to get away from the crowd. So there are times, and we need to be okay with this. And Jesus exemplified this principle throughout his earthly ministry. Now let's look at Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Beginning at verse number 5. And this is following up the comment that I made. The point of this prayer is to find, know, and do the will of God every day. Jesus exemplified this principle throughout his earthly ministry. Now let's read Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, surely tonight every one of us here believe that the man Christ Jesus is God manifest in the flesh. That John 4, 24 says that God is a spirit and a spirit doesn't have arms and legs. And that's what Jesus told his disciples when he appeared to them in the upper room. They said, it's a spirit. Jesus said, well, a spirit doesn't have arms and legs as you see me have. And so God is that spirit. But he manifested himself in the man Christ Jesus. So God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. So when Philippians says, Philippians 2, 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, the image, he was the image of the invisible God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Jesus Christ, the man Christ Jesus, had all the power and all of the authority that was in God invested in himself. Matthew 28, 
18, 19 says that all power, Jesus said this, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. That's what Jesus said. But he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But verse 7 says, but made himself. Made himself. Now, if you underline things in your Bible, underline that if, you, if you're okay with that. Because Jesus made himself of no reputation. Took upon him the form of a servant. A servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man. He what? Humbled himself. And became obedient unto death. Even the death of the cross. Wherefore now. Now here's, here's where the rubber beats the road for Jesus. And, and him humbling himself. Making himself of no reputation. Lowering himself to the point of a servant. Yet he was God in flesh. As a result. God, the Bible says, wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, this is amazing. Again, we're talking about the ministry of the saints. What did Jesus do? He prayed. What did Jesus pray? He prayed what he taught us to pray in Matthew chapter 6. But he also got up every day and, and to find, know, and do the will of his Father. And he exemplified this in his life every day. Even though he had power and authority as God in flesh. But he owned himself, lowered himself, took on the form of a servant, made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Humbling himself and God exalted him, giving him a name above every name that at that name every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the ministry of the saints. We are sons of God. We, we, we did a, I think it was three parts on the sons of God. Just it's been a month or so or two back we talked about sons of sonship and how important is sonship when you start looking at these particular verses of scripture the son of God did this therefore those who call themselves born again believers who are now sons of God this is our ministry may I ask a question for those of you here in the room and those watching online, do you see this in the scriptures? It does it does it resonate in any part of your spirit? You know, it's not really a, a question that I even answer to, but I'm asking myself this question: Do I really believe what the scripture says? Do I really believe that the earthly ministry of Christ is now my ministry? He was the Son of God, but I am now a Son of God, and I have received the same Spirit of Christ. The same Spirit that raised the Lord Jesus from the dead is the same Spirit that dwells in me. And what Jesus did when he walked the earth, do I believe that I have that ministry? And we could start throwing out the but, 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 no. There is no buts to this. There is no, there is no excuses for us. We're either sons of God or we're not. And if we are sons of God, then the reason the Lord is bringing this, this, the ministry of the saints to us in this hour is because as we approach this worldwide, worldwide, end time, apostolic revival and harvest, as we approach that moment when when those gates of hell that were defeated at call to war back in October, as those gates of hell were defeated and the Prince of America was defeated, and now all of those souls have been loosed, and now they're, they're, they've got this opportunity to make a choice, and, and that they're not they're not being held by that spirit of iniquity any longer. And when all those souls start to be start pouring into the kingdom of God. There's no way that this can that this can be managed with, with one voice. 
and one pulpit. Jesus didn't do it by himself. He trained 12. And then he picked 70. He sent the 12 out. Then he sent 70 more out. He said, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. And they didn't even have the Holy Ghost for crying out loud. And then there was the 120 in the upper room, and then the 3,000, and then the 5,000, and daily such as should be saved. Why? And you get over into Acts chapter 7, and you find out why. The widows were being neglected in the daily ministrations. Why? Because the church was growing, and the apostles couldn't deal with, with, with the number of the crowd and still have the time they needed to pray and seek God. So what did they do? They had to break it down even further. So these 12, they picked out seven. Yeah, I know it seems like the number is going down. But when you start, you take those seven, and who knows what they did. We don't really know. But those seven had to have found others to minister with them because the body was continuing to grow. So the body now has to start ministering to the body. And so this is the ministry of the saints. And this is, I'm giving more and more away as we go through this. And the Lord hasn't let me fully disclose everything that we're going to be doing in the very near future. Concerning the ministry of the saints. But we, if we get this now, we get a hold of this ministry now. Realizing that when I walk up to someone on my job, well that would be here. But when you walk up to somebody on your job or at the grocery store, and I, I mentioned this before, and and they notice something in you, they they your spirit is is glowing and, and the Holy Ghost is radiating off of you, and they walk by and they they look at you and they say something's different about you, and uh, would you pray for me? We need to be ready at, at the drop of a hat to be a minister because we are. The saints of the Most High God, and we have a ministry. And just before Jesus' death, his earthly ministry almost complete, Jesus prayed for us. Now go with me to John chapter 17. This is an amazing prayer, and we're, and we're getting somewhere with this. I'm watching the clock. Just before Jesus' death, his earthly ministry almost complete, Jesus prayed for us. And in this prayer, listen while you turn. And in this prayer, he is conferring upon the soon-to-be sons of God. He is conferring upon the soon-to-be sons of God his glory. And it was his to give because of his relationship with the Father. Now begin reading with me at verse number 11. John 17, verse 11. These, these words are all in red. And now I am no more in the world. Okay, this is the garden. Or at least they're, if they're not in the garden of Gethsemane, they're on their way to the garden of Gethsemane. This is after the Lord's, what we would call the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, and what we would call communion. And he's teaching from them to them, John 13, 14, 15, 16, as they're walking to the garden just before he is arrested and taken before Pilate. And he says, and now I am no more in the world. This is prophetic. He's speaking of the time when he's going to be when he ascends to heaven. But these are in the world. And this is a prayer. Go back and read the whole chapter. This is truly the Lord's prayer. Not Matthew 6. This is the Lord's prayer. He says. But these are in the world. And I come to thee holy father. Keep through thine own name. Those whom thou hast given me. Listen. Listen. That they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, 
that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Listen to the words that Jesus is using. Pray to his Father for these eleven. Or now, there's still twelve at this point. One of Judas has already gone to, 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 to uh, betray him. So he's praying about these eleven. He says, I'm praying that they, will, that they will have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them, listen, Jesus says, I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. Listen to the words of Jesus. Don't take them out of the world, Father. Because I've given them your I've given them your word. I've put my joy in them. So don't take them out of the world. But that you would keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Jesus is conferring in prayer upon his disciples the same power and authority and the word that his father had given him. And now Jesus is taking that as the son of God. God manifest in the flesh. And now passing this on to these 11. Why? Because he says this. Verse 17. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now this, this is uh, again a prophetic word about the day of Pentecost. And them receiving the Holy Ghost and being sanctified. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone. But for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Now, listen. How important is that? He's praying for the eleven. He's praying for his disciples. And however many will come after this. This is not just a prayer for that moment in time. But for that moment and then forward till even now. But he says, I don't pray for these alone. But for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Listen. Jesus, three and a half years of ministry is done. It's over. In just a few hours, he's going to, to be arrested. He's going to be taken to Pilate. He's going to be beaten and crucified. His earthly ministry is over. Not another miracle is done. Not another healing that we know of in the scriptures. Nothing else is done. It's over. And he is conferring upon his disciples. And he said, what I gave them, Lord, I am praying for them right now. But not for them only, but for those that will, that will believe on me, Jesus said, through their word. Your word, Brother Garcia. You preaching the gospel. Yes, I said preaching. That doesn't mean you got to stand here and do what I'm doing. Amen. But ministering the word of the Lord to anybody, somebody, anywhere, anytime. Because we are sons of God. We are disciples of Christ, are we not? Amen. We are taught and trained ones. That's what a disciple is. It's an it's a, and it's a adherent to someone else's doctrine or teaching. That's what we are. We are adherents to the Lord Jesus and his doctrine. But he said, I'm praying for all of those who will believe on me through what they do and what they preach. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee. That they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Oh, my Father. I, every time I read this, the, Jesus is depending on us. He's depending on the ministry of the saints for the world to believe that Jesus Christ is who he said he is. How are they going to know, Brother Barber? They're not going to know unless somebody tells them. Let's read that verse again. 
Verse 21, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me. What is he saying? Jesus is saying, he's, he's praying, Father, I have declared your name. I have declared your glory. I have declared your power to these that you have given me. Now he said, I am praying that these that you have given me will take what I have given them and now they will go to the world and the world will believe that you sent me. That's what Jesus said. Now verse 22. And the glory which thou gavest me. It's one of those next four words. I have given them glory. I, in, in another place, I didn't look it up today, but in another place, you know, God's not going to share his glory with anyone. But here Jesus says, I have given them the glory which you gave me. I'm giving it to them. That they may be one even as we are one. I don't have to explain the we part, do I? Because when Jesus uses the word we, that is not a plurality of, of people or persons in the Godhead. Jesus Christ was God manifest in the flesh. And when he says the glory that I had with thee before the world was, that is because God, that Jesus Christ was still in God. He had not yet come incarnation into car into the incarnation yet he was yet in God not in the flesh he, Christ did not pre-exist at least in the flesh Christ pre-existed in God so when he says we he's referring to himself as the son of God as God manifest in the flesh that part that he had before the world was before there was the man Christ Jesus so he says, the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Now just let me read for a second what the word glory means. It primarily signifies an opinion, an estimate, and hence the honor resulting from a good opinion. <coughs> the word glory is used, listen, can you please listen very closely. The word glory is used of the nature and acts of God in self-manifestation. For example, what he essentially is and does, as exhibited in whatever way he reveals himself in these respects, and particularly in the person of Christ, in whom essentially his glory has ever shone forth and ever will do. I'm reading from Vines. This is Vines Expository Dictionary of the New Testament. The word glory is used of the nature and acts of God in self-manifestation. So every miracle that Jesus did was God manifesting himself in and through the Lord Jesus Christ when he healed the leper, when he raised the dead. Y'all following me? I know it's been a long day. And I, I know you're tired. Mm -hmm. Just give me just a few more minutes, please. When Jesus walked on the water. When Jesus spoke to 
the wind. No, not even speak to the wind. He rebuked the wind. And it became a great calm. And Jesus spoke to the blind and his eyes were opened and unstopped the deaf ears. And when he, the woman taking her only son to the graveyard, Jesus stopped and they lowered the, the beer that they were carrying that, that child in. And they were carrying it on their shoulders. They lowered it down and Jesus raised that woman's only child from the grave, from the dead. That is the nature and acts of God in self-manifestation and it was through the Lord Jesus Christ. And didn't I just read that, that that is the word glory that was used in verse 22 in John 17. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them. We've got no excuses. There's no buts, but, but no. There are none. Jesus said, what I did on the earth, I'm giving that glory to you. Listen, it was exhibited in the character and acts of Christ in the days of his flesh. At Cana, when he turned water into wine, both his grace and his power were manifested, and those constituted his glory. So also in the resurrection of Lazarus, the glory of God was exhibited in the resurrection of Christ and in his ascension and exaltation. Because just as you said, as you seen him go, and if you look at the coming of the Lord, you look at the rapture of the church, aren't we going to be meet the Lord in the air just the way Jesus Christ, when he ascended to heaven, we're going to go just like he did. And, and this is the acts and, and self-manifestation of God in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ gave us that glory. He gave that glory to you and me. It's quiet. My thoughts exactly. Because, Sister Andy, it's the truth. It's, it's, it's black and white and red letters that Jesus has put in, it's in the scriptures. It's right here before us. Everything that Jesus did when he walked the earth is everything he expects you and me to do in his physical absence. When the word, listen, when the word, this is logos, that this was, this is logos, the written word. When the word was made flesh, the man Christ Jesus, God, manifested himself, his presence, his glory in the man Christ Jesus by many signs and wonders. We, you and me, by that same word, the Logos, cannot settle just for God's omnipresence, where he's everywhere present. I'm going to tell you, throughout my lifetime, I've just been content with, well, I'm in his presence because he's everywhere. I'm not settling for that ever again. I'm not settling just for the fact that God is omnipresent. And I'm going to I'm going to start over. When the word was made flesh, that is the man Christ Jesus. God, his father, manifested himself, his glory, his presence in the man Christ Jesus by many signs and wonders. We, by that same word, cannot settle just for God's omnipresence, where he is everywhere present. The man Christ Jesus exhibited for the sons of God, the saints, what is of absolute necessity, his manifest presence. Jesus Christ in the earth exhibited what he, what he was giving us when he said, I'm giving them my glory. Jesus Christ exhibited that, lived it, set the example for us. That the sons of God, the saints, 
would have this knowledge of this absolute necessity of the manifest presence of God. And this is what Jesus called it, his glory. The same spirit that was in Christ is the same spirit that is in the saints. The ministry of the saints is everything that Jesus did when he walked the earth. Just very quickly, go with me to Mark chapter 1. This is, and this is where I'll stop. Mark chapter 1. Begin reading at verse number 9. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John and Jordan. And straightway coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And immediately the spirit dried with him into the wilderness and he was there in the wilderness forty days, tempted of Satan and was with the wild beasts and the angels ministered unto him. Now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee. Okay, I'm gonna just I'm just gonna say it like this. When Jesus was baptized, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like you and me as believers being water baptized and being filled with the Holy Ghost. He was driven into the wilderness and tempted. We are tempted. Driven places that we never really wanted to go but yet tempted but coming out of those temptations and the, another writer says that Jesus came out of the wilderness in the power of the spirit temptations and tests bring us closer to God and it, it produces power in our lives because when we learn to walk by faith that in itself produces power so, so what does it say he did when he came out of the wilderness? Jesus came into Galilee. What does it say? Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now as he walked by the sea of Galilee. Now this is just only one of the gospel writers. This is where the Lord took me. It's pretty comprehensive. Several things here of everything that Jesus did. Of the things that Jesus did. Verse 15 and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, as he walked by the sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, but they were fishers. Mark doesn't record it, but this is where Jesus gave them the great drought of fishes. And he called his Peter, and Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me and follow me. Come ye after me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also who also were in the ship, mending their nets. And straightway he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. And they went into Capernaum, and straightway on the Sabbath day he entered into the synagogue and taught. They were astonished at his doctrine. Now listen. They were astonished. I'm sorry, I lost my place. For he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. He taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. The scribes were professional writers. There's another word that Paul uses, the wisdom of men in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2. It's, we get the words sophisticated from that word, which is a group of people who were sophisticated speakers and they would just rattle on about nothing, but yet they could draw an audience and they would just talk and be loud and long and people would be drawn to them. They were just sophisticated, speaking big words, but saying nothing. But Jesus taught as one who had authority, not as the scribes. There was in their synagogue, listen, Jesus was, this, was just teaching, was not paying attention to this man. There was in the synagogue a man with an unclean spirit who cried out, 
saying, Let us alone. What have we to do with thee, thou Jesus of Nazareth? Art thou come to destroy us? I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. This is the ministry of the saints. He's exhibiting, he's exampling, he is demonstrating for us what we are going to do. Jesus wasn't even addressing the demon, but he, the presence that was in him caused that demon to cry out. He said, I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace and come out of him. And when the unclean spirit had torn him and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed, insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commanded to even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. And immediately his fame spread abroad throughout all the region round about Galilee. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. And then even when the sun did set, they brought unto him, listen, when the even was come, the sun was set, they brought unto him all that were diseased. And them were possessed with devils, and all the city was gathered together at the door, and he healed many that were sick of divers diseases, and cast out many devils. And all the city was gathered at the door. All the city was gathered at the door. And he healed many that were sick of divers diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak because they knew him. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. And Simon and all that, that were with him followed after him. And when they found him, he said unto them, they said unto him, all men seek for thee. And he said unto them, let us go into the next town that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. You see the, you see the, the progression, verse 35, in the morning, he rising a great while before day, he prayed, and then he says, Peter says, um, everybody's looking for you. He said, that's okay. The father said, we're going to the next town that I may preach. There also, but therefore came out four, and he preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. There came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, and touched him, and said unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leper, leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. And he straightly charged him, and forthwith sent him away, and saith unto him, See, thou say nothing to any man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer for thy cleansing. Those things which Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. But he went out and began to publish it much, and to blaze abroad the matter, insomuch that Jesus could no more openly enter into the city, but was without in desert places, and they came to him from every quarter. Do we believe the word of the Lord or not? This is what Jesus exampled for us. He lived it every single day of his three and a half years of ministry. But I've never laid my hands on a leper and seen them cleansed immediately. I have gone to an ICU ward where there was positive diagnosis of COVID-19, laid hands on them and prayed for them, walked out of there, put my gown in the little bucket, washed my hands and went home. I'm not bragging, but if Jesus sent me to pray for the sick, then he's going to cover me and keep me. What would make me afraid to not do anything else that the Lord would want me to do? This is exactly what Jesus did. He was, yes, I know he was the Son of God. And I don't like having to 
qualify that every single time. I understand that. But what was he? Yes, he was the Son of God, but he was in flesh. He was living that life in the flesh on purpose. He overcame the things he overcame in the flesh for our benefit. He healed the sick. He raised the dead. He unstopped the ears. He did all of those mighty miracles. He walked on water. Tell me. You ever walked on water? Not yet. But if it requires it for end time, worldwide, I was thought of revival and harvest, then the Lord's going to have to put a highway underneath that water for me to walk on. Right. Am I just whistling Dixie? Or am I telling the truth? We've talked about it. We've preached about it. But never before in our lifetime has it come to this point where we, we are actually we are actually about to start living. Living out the very scriptures themselves. What's the prophecies are coming true? Why not the acts and ministry of the Lord Jesus that he gave us his glory? to do. So we go back to Ephesians chapter 1 where Paul said I pray that their eyes would be enlightened that they would receive that he said I pray for them to have the spirit of wisdom and revelation their eyes being enlightened they will know what is the hope of their calling, what is the riches of the glory of Christ's inheritance in the saints, what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand, far above all principality and power and might, and dominion gave him to be that, and, and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might every name that is named, not only in this world, but in that which is the world. And gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Body. We are his body. This is the ministry of the saints. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, Lord, I know right now this is hard for us to fathom. God, we are limited in our understanding. We are limited in our strengths and abilities and talents, but you have given us plenty. God, for what you have called us to do for the ministry of the saints, you have empowered us. You've given us your spirit. You've, you've given us the glory that you had with your Father. You've given it to us. But yet, O oh Lord, there is one thing we lack, and I pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I pray that the eyes of your people would be enlightened, that we will know and see and understand. God, not with our natural eyes first, but we will see first with our understanding, that spiritual understanding, God. That that inner man will begin to see this first, and then, Lord, we will see it with our natural eyes of fulfillment of these words. And so, Lord, I pray upon your people. I confer, Lord, as much as in me is to do so, O Lord. I confer upon them, Lord, this spirit of wisdom and revelation. I pray upon them now this understanding. I pray that their eyes will be enlightened, their spiritual eyesight, O oh Lord, would be flooded with light, that they would be able to see and know who you are and who we are in you. God, this is the ministry of the saints. You're not here anymore, but we are here, Father, and you have called us for such a time as this. And every single one of us, if they are in this room, if they're watching online, oh Lord, I believe with all of my heart that we are those people that you have chosen. Oh, there are lots more, I know. But these, Lord, are here tonight. And for them, I pray 
and for the rest of your body tonight in Jesus name I pray this with faith believing that you will indeed reveal by your life the knowledge of truth and I bless you I praise you I thank you now bless them Lord with their with rest and strength bless their homes their families physically mentally emotionally spiritually financially God, even psychologically, whatever they have need of, God, give them a great holiday tomorrow and in the weeks and months that are ahead. And we bless you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you for being here tonight. In Jesus' name.